Thank goodness for ice. The Democrats want to abandon ice. And ice is tough and smart. On the 2016 recording given to CNN, Cohen and then-candidate Trump reportedly discussed buying the rights to a story of an alleged affair with Playboy model Karen McDougal. The big picture is, A, there's nothing on the tape that suggests any kind of crime. Pop star Demi Lovato is now awake after being hospitalized for an apparent overdose. Initial reports claimed heroin may have been involved, but Fox is told that is not the case. House Republicans unveil their new tax cut package. The GOP plan would make the cuts signed last year permanent. Republicans hope to have their plan passed by the midterms. Here with us today is an extraordinary man, Sergeant Alan Jones. I've been told that I could never enter the Oval Office. Live from New York City on this, the 25th day of July. Who welcome to this Wednesday? It's wet here. July here. is almost over. School starts back next month for many people in the South. Ah, really? It's just you crazy pumped up how about time that? flies by. Welcome back. Hey, thank you. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. My, uh, my daughter was in uh, Colorado for the uh, for these national uh, soccer championships. Because she is a star. Right. She's doing great. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the team's doing very well. Uh, they lost three one-goal games, so therefore I'm back. So, uh, and so is she. So, what um, year is she in school? What is she going into? What grade? Uh, she's going into 10th grade. Okay. So, well, congratulations right. to get that far. It's quite an achievement. Right. And it's certainly a long plan, right? Uh, but I was able to keep up with everything. And meanwhile, nothing has really slowed down, especially around 6 o'clock last night. Oh, by the way, there's going to be a tape released about uh, Donald Trump and his uh, um, maligned attorney, Michael Cohen. Well, Brian, it sounds like you're watching CNN again because a secret recording between President Trump and for his former attorney, Michael Cohen, has now been revealed. And in that tape, which was leaked by Cohen's lawyer to CNN, the pair reportedly discussed purchasing the rights to a story about an alleged affair with a Playboy model. And we covered this last night on our channel, and Griff Jenkins has got the rest now in Washington on how the president's team is responding, Griff. Good morning, guys. Welcome back, Brian. Look, this is a recording from just before the election in September of 2016 between then-candidate Trump and his uh, personal attorney, Michael Cohen. Now, here you're going to hear the two men reportedly discussing buying the rights to the story of an alleged affair Mr. Trump had years earlier with Playboy model Karen McDougal. Now, Cohen is speaking first, then Trump. Listen. Well, I have to pay you, so it's getting old. No, 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 no. I got no, no. Cohen's attorney, Lanny Davis, gave the tape to CNN and did not provide a copy to Fox News to verify the tape's authenticity. And as you heard, it's a bit muddled and unclear if the president is saying that they should or should not pay with cash. The president's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, slammed the release of this tape and sought to explain what we were hearing talking to Laura Ingram last night. The major point is it's outrageous that someone would tape his client. President Trump says, quote, don't pay with cash. Cohen then interrupts and says, no, 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 I got it. And then you hear distinctly, if you're careful and you slow it down, check. And then Cohen follows with no, 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 and then quickly cuts off the tape. I know how to listen to them. I know how to transcribe it. This tape is crystal clear when you listen to it. Giuliani has maintained that no money was ever paid. Meanwhile, Cohen's attorney, Davis, says his client has been repeatedly attacked by Giuliani and that the truth is on his client's side. My client has been disparaged over and over again by Mr. Giuliani with misinformation and misstatements. There's been a campaign out of the White House to disparage Mr. Cohen. And why is that, Chris? Because he's got truth on his side. And a lawyer for the Trump organization, guys, also denied that Mr. Trump was offering to pay cash, saying there was no such transaction. The White House has not commented and frequently does not referring to outside counsel. 
Brian Ainsley, Steve. All right, Griff, thank you very much. Uh, this is the tape that the president lashed out on Twitter about, uh, I think, on Saturday, where he said it was probably illegal what Mr. Cohen had done. The big question is, and I heard somebody on the television last night say that uh, Mr. Cohen could be in trouble if uh, the president was on the phone in, for instance, Florida, right, a two-party state, because both parties had to know that uh, he was being taped. New York, not a problem. But nonetheless, it does raise the question, why was Mr. Cohen? taping his client well and whatever you tell your attorney is supposed to be protected right most of the time I thought all the time it was but I'm learning maybe that's not the case maybe you can get um, special in special circumstances mm -hmm. those tapes can be released but yeah why is he recording it and why was it released I thought well, anything Rudy, you did, tell Rudy did allow it to be released which is unbelievable strategy and they say that it doesn't make them look bad by the way i just don't know if you don't want if you don't have to have this release why would you release it there are 11 more tapes we understand michael cohen uh is he going to flip on the president is there anything to flip on right. are they going to look to unwind every business transaction he's done that michael cohen may or may not know about and just to think that you have a situation where you talk to an attorney who's supposed to be your friend who you are paying and if he's in Donald Trump's mm -hmm. office, which it sounds to me like it is, because I don't think Donald Trump does a lot of visiting with Michael Cohen's office, I wouldn't think. So because, and you hear the whole tape, you yeah. hear him covering a whole bunch of different things mm -hmm. until he it gets to Michael Cohen, right? He wants to uh, die in the divorce, middle of it. So I'm listening to this. Bunk. Can you imagine this, uh, Ainsley, you're paying somebody to represent you in the matter, whether it's a traffic violation Thinking or it's a divorce? Friend. Thinking it's your friend. And he feels as though he's got to tape you. And I just wonder, the way it cuts off abruptly, I wonder if they have the rest and they're waiting to see what the Trump side well, is does Well, this part next. of a deal that Michael Cohen is working on so that I'll release this if you let me off on other things? I don't things? know who Michael Cohen is talking to. There is he, right, is he somehow communicating to Southern District of New York? There, there were 12 tapes that, that were, were seized. Confiscated, yeah. Exactly. And apparently the president is only heard on one. Nonetheless, when you look at all of it, and they're discussing things that are unseemly, but here's the thing. Alan Dershowitz says they're not talking about anything illegal. The big picture is, A, there's nothing on the tape that suggests any kind of a crime. B, what is strongly suggested by the prior interview by Lanny Davis, is that he has, Cohn has made his decision. He's going to cooperate with the prosecutors. He's going to flip. He's going to try to get immunity, and he's going to testify against Donald Trump. Whether he has anything to say that's incriminating is a real question. And whether, even if he does, he's allowed to say it. Because remember, Giuliani didn't waive other privileges, just right. that tape. And even if he has something that might be incriminating, no evidence that he does, he can't reveal it unless it's a violation of the lawyer-client privilege or waived if it's lawyer-client privilege material. And Lanny Davis, who's best friends with Hillary Clinton, probably took the loss harder than anybody else, is just relishing in the fact that he could take some type of shot at the president. Not that he's not a fine lawyer, very experienced, but he's making Michael Cohen seem to be uh, Mother Teresa. And it is, uh, it's just the beginning of, I guess, uh, Lanny Davis's attempt to pay back Hillary Clinton or try to pay well, back Donald Trump for beating Hillary well, Clinton. Well, they're discussing transferring money for information regarding our friend David, Cohen says, which is a reference to David Pecker, who owns the Pres National Enquirer. Right. Presumably. That's right. So uh, Karen McDougal, McDougal allegedly um, said she'll give them the story of her alleged affair, and um, they paid her $150,000 allegedly, and then they never ran the story. So then she countersued and said, I was duped, I was tricked, you never ran the story and now she wants to be able to tell her story. So anyway, a lot of details, a lot of dots still need to be connected. Nonetheless, it's a big story people are talking about. Meanwhile, let's take a look in the rearview mirror. Yesterday, the President of the United States was out in Kansas City. He was at the VFW convention, an annual get together. Uh, and one of the things he talked a little bit about was the fact that so many vets uh, now work for ICE. And ICE is getting absolutely uh, pummeled by a number of Democrats who want to get rid of it. And the president said this about the men and women who wear the ICE uniform. We're fighting every day to secure our borders, and we're doing a great job. But we're not given the tools. We have the worst laws in any country. Thank goodness for ICE, because we have some of the worst drug dealers, terrorists, criminals. ICE is tough and smart, and they track them down and they stop tremendous amounts of crime. But Democratic politicians want to abolish ICE. They want to see open borders. 
Can you imagine? They've launched vicious smears on the brave men and women who defend our communities. And it's just ridiculous. And among those people, it's not just hypothetical. Senator Gillibrand wants to do that. She says that every time you give her a microphone, she screams into it. Uh, Senator Warren, who is the front runner now, many people think, to be the next Democratic nominee. Uh, Mark Pocan was uh, the one who introduced this, the, the Democratic congressman from the House, on how to abolish ICE. Also happening overnight, this is an embarrassment to the country. Portland is kicking out ICE from their offices. They said, if you don't pack up and leave, we're kicking you out. The Can you imagine that? The protest. Unbelievable. Anyway, uh, a lot going on, um, and we're going to fill you in on that. Yeah, the president also talked about the veterans, as you kind of mentioned, and he brought this 94-year-old veteran up on stage, and he had a few requests for the president. He wanted an autograph, and he wanted his his family. That's oh, whatever. Yeah. I love this story, and we're going to interview him today. He's so precious. Right. I'm like, wait, hold on. Sorry, I didn't know it was in the headlines. All right, tell us you more. News? I promise. That's a little tease. That's okay. to come. Let's get to a Fox News alert right now, though. Two American ISIS suspects captured in Syria will now face charges in the U.S. A Michigan man is due in court today. He's accused of joining the terror group in 2015 and was captured in June. And an Indiana woman also facing charges for making false statements to the FBI. She was brought back to the U.S. with her four children. Her husband was killed fighting with ISIS. A Trump endorsement proves huge in the Georgia GOP gubernatorial runoff, leading to a big win for Brian Kemp. The Secretary of State beating out Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. Kemp will face Democrat Stacey Abrams in November. He's wasting no time kicking off his campaign against her. The out-of-touch radical liberal who cares more for her billionaire backers than for you all, you hard-working Georgians. Stacey's money's coming from California, New York, in Massachusetts, not Georgia. If Abrams wins, she would be the first black female governor in the U.S. President Trump getting tough on trade as he prepares to host the European Commission president at the White House today. It comes as he threatens new tariffs if the EU won't play ball with trade policies. They didn't want to change. I said, okay, good. We're going to tariff your cars. They said, uh, when can we uh, show up? When can we be there? Uh, would tomorrow be okay? The Trump administration also announcing it will provide $12 billion in financial aid to farmers hit hard by recent tariffs. And Ainsley's favorite story, a 94-year-old World War II veteran gets his birthday wish granted by the president. I'm going to be 95 years of age, April 11th of next year. Hopefully that you will allow me to bring my family into the old yes. office to meet you. The president inviting retired Sergeant Alan Jones to the stage during his speech at the VFW National Convention in Kansas City, Missouri. He'll join us live in the 8 o'clock hour of Fox and & Friends, and he is uh, so adorable. Did you see him go up those stairs? Yeah, oh yeah. My goodness. I, know. I know, so fast. It's like he's 60. Hey, nice to meet you. I'd like a tour uh, of I your know. office. And he had a, it looked like a picture, and he said, Mr. President, can you sign this too? So That's I so want to cool. go to the Oval Office and please sign this. <laughs> hey, you never know if you don't ask. That's right. That's and he did, and he will be with us in the the 8 o'clock hour. Jillian, thank you. All right, uh, 13 minutes after the hour. Now we know how easily partisan politics can play a role in the FISA court. Should it actually be abolished altogether? The case laid out by Bill McGurn in a matter of moments. And do you remember the student who got suspended for wearing a pro uh, Trump t shirt? Well, there's a big update on his case, and we think you're going to like it. All right, FISA documents now revealing how partisan officials misled FISA court judges, some would perceive after reading this. And now a Wall Street Journal op-ed makes the argument that the FISA court should just be abolished. Bill McGurn wrote it. We brought him here, but here's a little of what he said. Congress should consider getting rid of the FISA courts altogether because without judges to hide behind, executive officials who order spying on their fellow citizens will have to own those decisions themselves. Bill McGurn sits on the Wall Street Journal editorial board and made that uh, editorial yesterday. So, Bill, well, you really want to just get rid of it because yeah. you read what you read, redactions and all? No. Um, and actually, I, in fairness, this isn't my original argument. Uh, Robert Bork made this argument in the Wall Street Journal 40 years ago, right before FISA was signed into law, and he predicted these kind of abuses. Basically, um, 
judges have no business being in a FISA decision. It's not like a criminal warrant. They're trying to find information. And when you do it, what he predicted is you'll see abuse because either the judges will unnecessarily defer to the intelligence agencies because they have superior technical knowledge or they'll insert their own views and opinions in it. It's just, it's just a very bad thing. If you look at this application, I think it's pretty flimsy, um, but no one's going to have any consequences for it because it has the names of the judges on it. In fact, that's the, the counter argument. Four judges signed off on this. Republican appointed. Yeah. But the Republicans, these judges can only get what they've been handed. Right. So they have no counter argument. There was no pushback. As Devin Nunes said last night with Sean Hannity, he said, OK, fine. You think all this stuff is fact. What about the other side? What right. about how conflicted Bruce Orr was with his wife working for right. uh, for this um, uh, for well, Sim for also, Simpson? I think it's hard for people out there uh, to make sense of the claims and the counterclaims. But it is interesting. Devin Nunes has come under withering assault. I, I think he's done some excellent work. Uh, he wants to declassify the redacted parts. It's interesting who wants to keep this stuff hidden. With who is, and that is, the people that did the investigating, right. the people that did the presenting. They should be proud of Adam the case Schiff, they put all out these there. People, we, we should be pushing. Look, the one thing I don't understand is why Donald Trump doesn't just declassify all of it so we can all see for ourselves what happened. It would be a lot better than going after security clearances. Let's see what these people were up to in 2016. And it's also, this application is put together, they say, well, did you list that this person might have had an axe to grind against Donald Trump? Did you? Yeah, put it. But how is it emphasized? How is it presented? Right. Page 14, you bring up that uh, they, but this person who did this thing might have something against candidate number one, who was Donald Trump. Well, I think, and it was Christopher Steele. Right. I mean, look, I think that um, when you're getting information about this, in the same way in a criminal investigation, if you're investing the mo uh, investigating the mob, the kind of people that are going to give you information are probably not Boy Scouts. Are probably criminals themselves. And the same holds in foreign intelligence. You're going to get some dubious sources. But what the FBI didn't do is say there are 10 assertions in the Steele dossier. What they should have done is then check them out. Say, you know, Brian told us X. We right. went out and checked X and we verified it. They didn't do it. What they said is we worked with Brian before and we liked him. That's so it. we're going to, I mean, spying on right. an American citizen is a big deal, should be a big deal. So ban the court. Uh, read Wall Street Journal, Bill McGurn. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brian. All right, straight ahead, pop star Demi Lovato uh, recovering from an apparent overdose. What's happening with her? Shining a spotlight on the problem, gripping the nation, perhaps? A doctor on the front lines of the epidemic joins us inside that story next. Okay. are back with a Fox News alert that Toronto shooter that killed two people and injured more may have been an ISIS fanatic. A law enforcement source tells CBS News that Faisal Huzan visited ISIS and websites and possibly expressed support for the group. And three U.S. diplomats are back in the United States after making a surprise trip to Cuba. State Department officials visiting the American embassy in Havana to investigate a string of mysterious health incidents dating back more than a year that we've been telling you about. And 10 tourists drowned when their boat capsized trying to escape the raging wildfires in the country of Greece. Look at that. An official calling the infernos a biblical disaster. At least 74 people have died in the fires not far from the city of Athens. All right, Ainsley. Thank you, Steve. Pop star Demi Lovato rushed to the hospital recovering from an apparent overdose. Despite initial reports, sources telling Fox News it was not heroin, although we do know she, the singer, was treated for opioid reversal with the opioid reversal drug called Narcan at the scene. Dr. Daniel Bober is a certified addiction medicine physician, and he joins us now with reaction. Dr. Bober, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Angela. You're Great welcome. to be here. We want to shed some light on this because it's clearly a problem. Opioid death, number one cause for injury death in the United States. You know, she's young. So many people look up to her. How can you weigh in on this, please, with all your experience? Well, you know, Ainsley, this is a horrible uh, epidemic, 120 people a day overdose in this country, and we spend $80 billion a year in terms of health care costs and loss of productivity. So this should raise awareness uh, in our country about a horrible, horrible public health emergency. Uh, and there is treatment in the form of drugs like methadone and buprenorphine, which have been shown to cut the risk of death in half and the risk of overdose. But there's a lot of ignorance 
uh, in the community and people don't understand the difference between addiction and dependence. And so, uh, you know, we need to start looking at the way we're treating people and mobilize all our resources. Well, at first we thought this was a heroin overdose. And then there was a statement from her family saying that, um, you know, that everything that's being reported is not necessarily true. Then we're hearing from friends that were there saying it wasn't heroin, but we do know that Narcan was used. Would Narcan be used for another drug or a different type of overdose? You know, a lot of times Narcan will be used during an overdose when paramedics, for example, don't know what the drug is because mm -hmm. you can't really hurt someone by giving them Narcan. But if they did, in fact, overdose on opioids, that is the way to reverse them. So it seems strange to me that this is not heroin or some other opioid. But again, you know, we don't know for sure. How bad of a problem is this? Are you seeing a lot of, you know, individuals her age in their 20s using heroin? I, you know, I see this every day in my office. I see it every day in the hospital. Um, this is a, an illness that affects people regardless of their status. It doesn't matter who you are. We're seeing it in our communities and it's affecting us every day. Uh, so I see this all the time. What do you tell parents that have kids that are dealing with this? Well, that they have to get treatment very often. This requires residential treatment in a controlled setting. Uh, and it can be very costly and very expensive. And this is why, you know, I call upon the White House and President Trump to do everything they can to stem the tide of this uh, of this epidemic. What are the chances that people can be clean if they if they do have an addiction, if it has a hold on them? One of the greatest myths about addiction is that it can't be treated. You know, addiction is not treated the same way, for example, or thought of as the same way as heart disease or, or diabetes. You know, if someone tells you that you have, if someone tells you that they have an addiction, you know, we tend to look at them in a strange way. So we need to erase the stigma of addiction, but the rate of treatment and relapse or remission is similar to things like diabetes and asthma. So we can treat addiction the same way we treat any other medical illness. We just have to be willing to look at people with compassion and not judge them. I agree. Dr. Bober, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Saving Ainsley. lives. Attorney General Jeff Sessions ripping safe spaces and crying closets. Some schools are doing everything they can to create a generation of sanctimonious, sensitive, supercilious snowflakes. We're not going to have it. Tommy Lahren says it's about time. She's going to be live with us coming up next. And a new king of Capitol Hill has been crowned. Meet Hank the dog. Every dog has his day dog When the big dog throws him a bone One moment in the sunshine When you touch slide up in a row They have cry closets Safe spaces Optional exams Therapy goats And grade inflation Some schools are doing everything they can To create a generation Of sanctimonious sensitive, supercilious snowflakes. We're not going to have it. There you've got the Attorney General of the United States yesterday describing life on America's campuses. He was at Turning Point USA's High School Leadership Conference. Let's bring in Fox News contributor Tommy DeLaren, uh, joins us from the West Coast. Tommy, what do you make of the President, or rather the uh, Attorney General's comments regarding these sanctimonious snowflakes on America's campuses? Well, he's right on the money, and I think folks that have watched me know exactly how I feel about snowflakes, but this is really a bigger epidemic going on on our college campuses, and now our high school campuses, and all the way down to elementary school, and it's not just that kids go to college and they're surrounded by liberal classmates and liberal professors. I think the real problem here is that conservative and independent students go to college and they forget how to stand up for themselves, and I think that's the real problem, is that they have safe spaces for liberal ideas, but conservative ideas is they don't even get a platform with which to speak. So I think that's the real issue we have on our hands. He was calling out a number of schools, including Middlebury College in Vermont, University of California at Berkeley, saying that they have actively tried to silence conservative speakers. There's a report that at the top 45 colleges, no conservative was invited to give the commencement speech. Is this going to backfire or, you know, what are your thoughts about that? Is this, is this going to hurt the Democrats and some of these liberal campuses in the, in, in the long run? 
I think it will as people get smarter and they understand that our free, free speech zone is the United States of America at large and not the zones that college campuses arbitrarily put in place. But beyond that, when we're looking at college campuses, I think it's important to understand that truth has become the new hate speech. And it's not just college campuses, but it's also in the media. So it's important for conservative speakers, independent speakers, libertarian speakers to show up on college campuses and not be uh, allow themselves to be bullied, harassed and turned away. We're just going to have to be a little bit louder. We're going to have to utilize social media and we're going to have to make it more of an issue. Otherwise, college campuses are just going to be the bastions of liberal indoctrination and we will never win that battle. Yeah, but All right. yeah uh, Tommy, too. We're invited first. Yeah, yeah we're, going to, uh, we're going to talk to two people uh, about that very issue, including Zach uh, Wood, who was just on this couch, who said, I was at Williams College. I'm a liberal, but I went out of my way to invite conservatives and he got big pushback. Uh, but meanwhile, the President of the United States took a very aggressive tone against the Iranian leaders after they tried to call out America and threatened us with war. We used to look the other way, not under this president. You say it shows the apology tour is over? Well, absolutely. Isn't it nice to finally have a president that leads from a position of strength? And for all those that are outraged by this, they're the same folks that were upset just last week because the president tried to establish diplomatic relations with Russia, now outraged that he was too mean to Iranian leaders. So you can see the double standard at play there. But I believe that this president being tough on world leaders is exactly what has worked. We saw it work in North Korea. And I think soon as liberals understand that we didn't elect this president to be nice. We elected him to get things done, and he has. Maybe they'll understand the strategy and they'll get on board. Well, it, it, it is a kind of strategy. It, it does appear the tough talk because uh, the president yesterday in Kansas City at the VFW convention, Tommy, said that uh, Iran no longer the same country it was a while ago, and he's ready to make a deal. He said not like that last deal made by the last administration, but this administration is ready to make a deal when they are. Well, it really wasn't much of a deal. It was a concessions list, and this president is not going to do that again. And this president comes to the table, as I said, from position of strength, unlike the last administration who cowered in the corner. So that's how we get results. We're seeing it time and time again, and I think it really actually drives the liberals crazy how effective this president is because he's unconventional. Yes, he uses Twitter diplomacy, but guess what? It works. And as long as it's working, as long as it's bringing peace about in the world, they should be happy with it. But I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, right. Tommy. Great to see you. All right, let's hand it over to Jillian who has some more headlines for us. Hey, Jillian. That's right. Good morning. Following a number of stories, starting with this, a state lawmaker will resign after a disturbing appearance on Sasha Baron Cohen's new TV show. According to a spokesman for the Georgia House Speaker, Jason Spencer will leave his post by the end of the month. On the show called Who is America, Spencer is shown yelling racial slurs repeatedly. During another segment, he lowers his pants. Spencer lost the Republican primary in May, but could have remained in office through the November election. Imagine witnessing this moments before a flight. That's fuel pouring out of the wing of an American Airlines plane in Philadelphia. And check it out, video appearing to show responders cleaning it up with paper towels. Passengers were put on another plane to LA. The airline says it was a minor spill caused by a mechanical issue. A high school student suspended for wearing this pro-border wall shirt to school is getting the last laugh. We told you about this a little while ago. Well, now here's the follow-up. Addison Barnes, who filed a lawsuit, will receive a written apology from the school's principal and $25,000 from his Oregon district to cover legal fees. In a statement, Barnes says, quote, in part, I brought this case to stand up for myself and other students who might be afraid to express their right of center views. And now, meet the cutest dog on Capitol Hill, Hank the Boxer, winning the title after a vote on the Independent Journal Review website. He belongs to Congresswoman Liz Cheney's chief of staff and is known for making friends with the Capitol Police. Hank is adorable. And side note, it's like pouring outside right now. I know. It is. It is crazy. Well, you know what? I'm not going to take your word for it. I'm going out to the streets of New York City because Janice Dean, the weather machine, is in the weather. How long is it going to rain, Janice? Oh, it's raining. It's going <laughs> to rain all day today, my friend. Oh, no. uh, you know what? I don't mind this because I'm a weather person and I should be out in the elements. But I, you have to see what my cameraman, Ian, is wearing. I posted it on Twitter. Uh, he didn't come prepared. Let's just say that. Let's go to the maps. It's uh, raining across the Northeast and it's 74 here in New York with torrential downpours. And it's all because we have this stubborn trough that has been in place for the last last, well, couple of days, bringing the potential for flooding not only for the Northeast, but the Mid-Atlantic. We have seen on order of eight
8 to 12 inches over the last couple of days. And finally, as we get into the weekend, things will start to, uh, we'll get some relief, all right? But for now, flood advisories are up, including the New York City area right now, down to Philadelphia and parts of North Carolina. It is really boring. So we're going to see delays at the airports, my friends. And there's your forecast rainfall over the next couple of days. The Mid-Atlantic, I'm concerned about them because we have seen so much rain in that area over the last week or so. The other big story is the heat. We set a record in Phoenix, Arizona yesterday. Phoenix in July. It was 116 yesterday. Uh, things are going to start to lighten up in terms of temperatures as we get into the weekend. So there's the good news, but heat advisories are in place. Okay, can I come inside? Yes, now Janice, that was such a good tease. We had to go to Twitter and see what Ian was wearing. Can we zoom in on your Twitter picture? Uh, uh, there he goes. He's just wrapped in a tarp. Yes, he looks like a nun. He does and look like a nun. By the way, that's cotton, so it's not going to protect him. Okay. Right. Are you telling him that for the first time? And you have to know Ian's. Um, you have to know his personality, which you've described it on air before. What is it? Uh, very, not sarcastic. <laughs> no, very sarcastic. Very sarcastic. Very funny. The, the sun never comes out in Ian's world. 100% <laughs> chance of sarcasm with Ian. Everyone's laughing in here. I love you. We love you, Ian. Thank you very not much. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. His humor is so funny. He's just dry sense of humor. So when he does say something, it's always right. really funny. He, right? And he's been on the show for about 20 years. Right. He's angry and bitter. <laughs> 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 All right, it's not just on the football field anymore. It is an elected official kneeling during the Pledge of Allegiance before a town meeting. Look at that picture right there, that video. The outrage and the calls for her to step down coming up. Plus, the Democrats want you to think that the president's tax cuts are not helping everyday Americans. In terms of the bonus that corporate America received versus the crumbs that they are giving to workers to kind of put the schmooze on is so pathetic. But odds are your paycheck is bigger. So what's the real story? We're going to talk about money, money, money with Grover Norquist next. Money, 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 Good morning to you and welcome back. Some quick headlines now. A Democratic gubernatorial candidate is under fire for this campaign ad. Florida's Jeff Green slamming the NRA in this mailer showing poster boards with children as the bullseye. Green promising to ban assault weapons if he's elected. A Florida NRA lobbyist calls the poster, quote, repulsive. And the Ninth Circuit Court is backing the Second Amendment. The ruling comes after a Hawaii man's attempt to openly carry a handgun was shot down twice in 2011. A lower court ruled that the argued that the Constitution only applies to open carry inside your home. Steve. All right, Jillian, thank you. Meanwhile, Democrats have slammed the president's tax cuts as crumbs. In terms of the bonus that corporate America received versus the crumbs that they are giving to workers to kind of put the schmooze on is so pathetic. But do these numbers look like crumbs to you? A new study from the Heritage Foundation revealing more Americans are taking home bigger paychecks and paying less in taxes. A single taxpayer saving about $1,400 and over $2,900 for a married couple with kids. That's every year. Here to weigh in, founder and president of Americans for Tax Reform, Grover Norquist. Grover, good morning to you. Good to be with you. I'm confused. I remember before the tax cut bill passed, the Democrats yeah. were saying that only the top 1% would yes. benefit. But that yeah. doesn't look like the case. No, uh, that was what they said going into trying to stop the tax bill right. from passing. Uh, but uh, within a month, the IRS came out with the numbers on what percentage of American taxpayers actually would get a pay increase because a tax cut is a pay increase. When the government takes less of your money, you get more take-home pay. That's a pay hike. Absolutely. 90% uh, of Americans pay lower taxes today because of the Republican tax cut. 90% of American taxpayers got a pay increase, meaning you get to take home more money because the government takes less of it. So right. the difference between 1% and 90%, that's not a math problem. <laughs> the Democrats were lying. Uh, they weren't just sort of off by a little bit. Right. 
Yeah, but uh, Grover, don't you think people know that by now? I mean, we've got another graphic to show folks. A uh, typical sure. household, uh, $26,000 over yeah. 10 years. A family of yeah. four uh, get to keep 40, close to $45,000 more of their money, which ultimately we all want to do. We want to give Washington less of it, and keep more in our own pocket. But as we go into the midterms, yeah. The, you know, the Democrats' message is, we want to take that back from you. I don't know that that's a, a politically wise thing to say out loud. It's not. It, there is something interesting. Some polls suggest that a number of Americans are unaware that they're keeping more money. One of the reasons for that is 83% of Americans have direct deposit. So they never look at their paycheck because hmm. the pay, the, 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 their pay goes straight to the bank. Um, and it's nice, you don't have to go to the bank and drop off your paycheck and cash it every two weeks, but uh, it pays to go take a look at your bank sure. account. And uh, we saw Absolutely. in May an increase in consumer spending, we think, the economists think, because people looked at their bank account and said, I've got more money than I thought I did, that. and they made different decisions. So people are noticing the higher uh, pay, right. but it took longer than you'd expect sure. because of direct deposit. Well, I think a lot of people uh, up on Capitol Hill think uh, America hangs on their every word. They know what everybody's doing in Washington. Right. That is not yes. the case. But Grover, looking forward, you know, there's uh, they're now talking about uh, tax cuts 2.0, yes. where they would make these permanent. And it sounds like this uh, vote for it will be taken before the November elections. So not a single Democrat voted for it before, but this will be their opportunity to say, look, I'm allowing the middle class to keep more of their money. But right now, it sounds like all the Democrats are going to vote no again. Yes, that's almost certainly what's going to happen. Uh, the 2.0 does a couple of things. It reminds the American people that the Republicans in the House, the Senate, President Trump, have all made it clear, we're going to have a tax cut every year, a tax cut every year, not I mean, not tax reform, and then 30 years from now, another tax reform. Right. Every single year, we'll be culling down the tax burden on the American people. And this tells you, it may not pass this year because the Democrats will filibuster right. the Senate, almost certainly, but this is what we're going to do next year if we elect a Republican House and Senate, and it puts taxes front and center Right. of the election and those numbers you had you know twenty six thousand dollars over ten years it, it, it's, it becomes more difficult for nancy pelosi to sure. ex explain that that's a crumb no I'm kidding that's a you put all those crumbs together you wind up with a lot of dough just saying all right she could buy a pair of shoes the way she spends money personally all right uh he's from americans for tax reform rover thank you very much for joining us live steve thanks you bet all right, uh, 10 minutes before the top of the hour, new satellite images show North Korea apparently dismantling some key missile sites. Dr. Sebastian Gorka worked inside the White House and says there's more progress where that came from. He joins us live in the next hour. Plus, it's not just the football field anymore. That's an elected official kneeling during the Pledge of Allegiance at a town meeting. There's some outrage, as you can expect, and we're going to tell you about it. Connecticut town is outraged. Look at that video after that elected official, Melissa Schlag, takes a knee during the Pledge of Allegiance, protesting our president and his meeting with the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Okay, many in that community now calling on Schlag to resign. Joining us right now is Tim Herbst. He's a governor candidate for Connecticut. He wants to be the next governor there. First, he wants to win a primary. But I was stunned by this. Are you? Absolutely. It was appalling. She says, I was a Girl Scout, I marched in parades, I'm a patriot, but I sit there because families are no, our kids are kept in cages. We, have, we live in a, uh, a country where the universal health care isn't uh, plentiful and human rights are attacked on a daily basis in this country. She needs to resign immediately. Uh, you know, one of the things that the flag stands for, it stands for our freedom. It stands for our democracy. Uh, it stands for the fundamental ideal that we can have differences of opinion but we all stand in respect of our flag because many people, including my 93-year-old grandfather who was a veteran, fought in defense of the very liberties that that fa uh, flag resembles. Is this one of the reasons you want to be governor of Connecticut, liberal state? It's a liberal state that's in a very bad way. And I think this behavior is um, really reflective of the last eight years, uh, which, show, which shows a complete lack of respect uh, for our country, uh, for our leaders, 
Uh, and I'm running for governor because I think we need a wholesale change in Connecticut. We need leaders that are going to respect our president, respect our flag, respect our constitution. Right. Here's what she said uh, in her letter. It's lengthy. It starts off, Dear America. She says, I need to send a message by kneeling that none of this is okay and all of this is unpatriotic as it can get. And the antithesis of what America stands for as Donald Trump is president of the United States, I will kneel. So I guess if a Democrat uh, becomes president, all Republicans should kneel. Where does it stop? Well, this needs to stop. I mean, you know, when Barack Obama was president, I didn't vote for him. I wasn't happy about it, but I respected the office of president. And I think people need to respect the office of president and start respecting the fact that we have a president. And uh, this behavior is going to continue unless and until we have leaders that call it out for what it is. The president's approval rating, highest it's ever been. High, after, after, out of the last four administrations, this is the highest approval rating other than President Bush right after 9-11. How do your constituents feel? Well, I think in Connecticut, which is a blue state, what you're seeing is that the president has a higher job approval rating than the incumbent Democrat governor who's 15 points below where the president's job approval rating is. So I think it says a lot about what's going on in Connecticut. And I think that people are beginning to recognize the right. difference in leadership. Real quick, if you're going to be successful, you have to convince independents and Democrats to vote for you. You have Republicans if you get the nomination. Mm -hmm. What message is going to resonate? I think a message that focuses on fiscal reform in the state of Connecticut, reducing the cost of living, reducing taxes, dealing with our unfunded crushing pension uh, liabilities that are really killing our state. I think a strong fiscal right. message is, is what's going to work in Connecticut. High taxes in Connecticut. Very high. Friends right. live there. It's and health care has got to get solved. Absolutely. All right. Uh, four minutes right. before the time. Tim Herbst. Here. Good luck. Thank, right. you Thank you very much. Still ahead, Alan Dershowitz is going to be here live. Candace Owens is going to come on right after. Dr. Sebastian Gorka and National Economic Council Director Larry Kudlow. Speaker Paul Ryan. That's pretty good, Rob. How can we say when you... Thank goodness for ice. The Democrats want to abandon ICE. And ICE is tough and smart. On the 2016 recording given to CNN, Cohen and then-candidate Trump reportedly discussed buying the rights to a story of an alleged affair with Playboy model Karen McDougal. The big picture is, A, there's nothing on the tape that suggests any kind of crime. Pop star Demi Lovato is now awake after being hospitalized for an apparent overdose. Initial reports claimed heroin may have been involved, but Fox is told that is not the case. House Republicans unveil their new tax cut package. The GOP plan would make the cuts signed last year permanent. Republicans hope to have their plan passed by the midterms. Here with us today is an extraordinary man, Sergeant Alan Jones. I've been told that I could never enter the Oval Office. <laughs> Live from New York City on this, the 25th day of July. Welcome to this Wednesday. It's wet here. July here. is almost over. School starts back next month for many people in the South. Ah, really? It's just You're crazy pumped up about how time that? flies by. Welcome back. Hey, thank you. I'm glad to be back. Oh, my, uh, my daughter was in uh, Colorado for the uh, for these national uh, soccer championships. Because she is a star. She's right. Doing great. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the team's doing very well. Uh, they lost three one goal games, so therefore I'm back. So uh, and so is she. So what um, year is she in school? What is she going into? What grade? Uh, she's going into tenth grade. Okay. So well, congratulations right. to get that far. It's quite an achievement. Right.